The statehood, the nation, the people fighting for survival for their future and their homes. This is Ukraine Today. Good afternoon, this is Henry Keen on Yates English, breaking hard truth in easy terms for the whole free world directly from Ukraine. Today we celebrate the Day of Ukrainian Statehood. This holiday is intended to remind everyone that Ukrainian statehood actually has more than a thousand-year tradition. On this day, when Orthodox Christians celebrate the day of equal to the Apostles Prince Volodymyr of Kiev. Not Vladimir, like Putin, but Volodymyr, like Zelensky. The Russians are trying to steal our history again, nothing new, while title, Russia, itself, was a name to honor the Kiev Rus. Maybe that might ring some bells, but I really doubt that. The historical truth is, however, that the state of Russia was called Muscovy before Peter the Great decided to rename it to Russia. So history shows that the brave descendants of Rus were Ukrainians, not Moscovites, for some reason, in the year 988. The adoption of Christianity became a civilizational choice that determined the European path of Ukraine's development. Christianity contributed to the rise of culture and education and gave impetus to the development of the Cyrillic script. Kievan Rus successfully joined the pan-European cultural and religious space. Its statehood traditions were continued in particular by the Principality of Galicia Volyn, the Ukrainian Cossack state. The Ukrainian People's Republic, the West Ukrainian People's Republic and the Ukrainian states of Hetman Pavlo Skoropatsky, Carpathian Ukraine and modern independent Ukraine. The state and statehood are inseparable, like a tree and its roots. History gives society an awareness of the connection between generations and the construction of the common path. Attempts to deny Ukrainian history or to appropriate Ukrainian historical heritage by Moscow are just as ill and useless against historical facts as modern fakes of Russian propaganda. More than a thousand years of history of our statehood shows that it is necessary to win. Do not stop, but win. Do not begrain, but win. Do not rely on the whims of fate, but win, and build such a strong state that is potential and ability to defend itself. The face of our people in themselves, weapons in the hands of Ukrainians, and the unity of all together in the state guaranteed the preservation of the statehood of Ukraine and the non-repetition of aggression against our state. We do not believe that Russia will not want to return with aggression even after we drive out the occupies for all our land. But the victory of Ukraine can and must be such that any attempts by the enemy to return would not be beyond the sick fantasy of those lunatics who hatch such plans. It is our statehood that is our response to the need for security and peace for Ukraine. During the centuries of historical development, Ukraine lost and regained its statehood. So Ukrainians have a huge experience of the liberation struggle, which inspires and motivates our soldiers on the battlefield today. The day of Ukrainian statehood was introduced to confirm the continuity of the more than a thousand-year history of Ukrainian statehood as well as to counter Russian disinformation and historical fakes about the supposed unity of the origin of the Ukrainian and Russian peoples. The history of Ukrainian state formation is evidenced by the first time the foundation of the capital of the ancient Rus was mentioned, the city of Kiev and events related to the activities of Volodymyr Grand Duke of Kiev. Historical facts, as simple as that. Ukrainian fencer Olga Khalan was disqualified at the World Championship competition after refusing to shake hands with Russian Smirnova, who was competing under a neutral flag. Russian wanted a handshake, for some reason. After clearly winning 15-7, to 7, Olga Karlan initiated another type of sports greeting, crossing the blades of their sabers. This is a common practice among the athletes from countries that compete in sports while happen to be enemies on an actual battlefield, such as Palestine and Israel, for example. However, Smirnova insisted on a provocative handshake, probably knowing that her winning rival won't do it and most likely be disqualified. Oh, what a Russian spirit to lose the fight and to resort to dirty trick to get to medal at whatever the cost is, dishonor and shame will also do. Anna Smirnova lost the fair competition and decided to play dirty with the handshake show. This is exactly how Russian army acts on the battlefield. Olga Harlan won the fair competition and showed dignity. Dmitry Kuleba, Minister of Foreign Affairs of Ukraine, on Twitter. 
The Ukrainian side previously informed the International Fencing Federation that the Ukrainian athletes will not shake hands with athletes from Russia who are performing under a neutral flag. And what do we have here? The day before, the judges decided to change the rules. Handshake is a must now, they said. Almost three years during the COVID pandemic, crossing blades was acceptable for fencers, but now handshake somehow is the only choice. Despite the fact that the brother of Smynovo is serving in the Russian army forces and is the occupier of our land whose duty is to kill Ukrainians every day, and he's probably firing missiles at the harbors in Odessa and Nikolaev, the home city of Harlan. We realized that the country that terrorizes our state, our people, our families also terrorize these spots. What happened today is what should happen. I didn't want to shake hands with this athlete and acted with my heart. No one can ever be forced into peace, especially the Ukrainians. Never. No handshakes. Never. Therefore, it will also be so. And I probably, like everyone else in this world, an adequate world, understand that the rules must change because the world is changing. I mean, this is disgustingly awesome. Your brother destroys my city and kills my family, but I have to shake your hand. You know what? F word you. F word you. Russian Smirnova, your brother, and all the fencing federation, one by one and all together. You say sports should be out of politics, but your politics is killing my people. And I have to handshake the killer? Well, I won't accept that. And no Ukrainian will. Ever. Russian sports is a tool of a bloody Kremlin's regime and is used by the aggressor state or for oppressive political purposes, obviously. Ukrainian athletes strive to compete honestly and do not give up the fight. This is how we win. And we will compete with athletes on a neutral flag if they do not publicly support Russian aggression. Well, if they do, then just as I said, F word you, all of them. On July 27-28, the Russia-African summit was held in St. Petersburg. Despite the long preparation and anticipation, the Russian summit has a low level of representation for some strange reason. With this year's summit, Russia hopes to demonstrate that it remains an important player in the global political arena. A total of 17 out of 54 countries are represented. Five countries just ignored the invitation. Russia is obviously trying to corrupt African leaders with expensive gifts, and that is a welcoming superior neocolonial attitude towards them, whether Africans want to understand it or not. Russia harms the food security of Africa right before the summit by unilaterally withdrawing from the Black Sea Grain Initiative and threatening global food security, and now Putin's promises to supply six African countries with free grain which is yet another example of populism of Moscow. The declared volumes do not compensate for the deficit that arose due to the naval blockade of Ukraine. The leader of the Wagner PMC, Prigozhin, show up on the summit in turn shows clearly the very vector of modern Russian-African relations based on mercenaries, lies, violence and weapons. Russian propaganda openly rejoiced at the coup in Niger on the eve of the summit, and that is the only way, new colonial way, offered by the Kremlin to Africa. As Foreign Minister Dmitry Kuleba told his African counterparts that President Putin used the summit to attempt to whitewash his reputation, he was, of course, in no way concerned with making any decisions that benefit African countries. He will be focused on propaganda purposes only, as he is Putin. Ukraine's close relations with African countries as well as our partnership and active cooperation can help solve many problems, including those related to food security. We must take a firm and principled stand against Russian propaganda and food blackmail. Ukraine has always been and will continue to be a reliable food security council for the world, including African countries, no matter what. Following Russia's withdrawal from the Black Sea Grain Initiative, we urge all African countries to become equal partners and to join forces with Ukraine to ensure uninterrupted sea exports of Ukrainian foodstuffs. It was Henry Keane with some hard truth in easy terms for you on UATV English. Ask us a question and we do our best to answer it on our weekly episode on Sundays. Like us, subscribe and comment. Let us know your opinion. It is what really matters to us. Stay safe and tune for more.